the civil rights movement gains momentum across Australia in the 1960s. They fight for the right for simple things, to swim in a pool, try on a dress, give birth in hospital, to be served in cafes and enter hotels. They are part of a bigger movement sweeping the globe. As the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. A man called Eddie Koiki Mabo, a labourer, will take his personal fight to the highest authority in the land. He dares to challenge the very establishment of Australia. This is the story of a man, a rebel, a free thinker and a restless spirit, a husband and father, who saw far into the future and even further into the past. Several times we brought our kids into Huwenden when they were sick and the doctor would see them. We didn't have a vehicle at the time and there was no way of getting back. We had to go to the nearest pub or whatever and ask for a room. And for all the times we used to come in, the pubs didn't take us. They wouldn't accept black money or probably they thought we leave our skin on the sheets. Even through winter, you know how cold it gets out there. We would sleep on the railway station platform with the two kids. And because of that, I thought something would have to be done. We'd have to start to get political. Quickie, my boy. In Queensland, the first Australians live under government laws which have the power to detain and control them on state reserves. We'd been told all our lives that we were nothing. We'd been told by our teachers, uh, by the police. We were abused, we were violently assaulted, we were excluded, we were thrown off trains, we were spat on. And with greater and greater numbers, it was possible to say, we will not tolerate this constant abuse. Koiki's story begins on a tiny island off the coast of Queensland in what is called the Torres Straits. His people call the island Mare. Outsiders know it as Murray Island. My lifetime on Murray, I think, was the best time of my life I ever spent. Growing up on Murray, I was going through my traditional education. It was done by my dad. He took me through a whole lot of things to try and make me realize that white beliefs were not the only ones. We also had value in ours as well. Kwikimabo. Koki's father taught him about the laws that govern his people. The laws were bought by a god they called Marlo. Before time began, Marlo came from the west. Moving through the water from island to island, it changed its form as it travelled, first in the shape of a whale, then a canoe, until finally, as an octopus, Marlo came to rest at Mare. The first moving film in Australia recorded the sacred Marlowe dance. Through this dance, Marlowe's law was passed down in time from generation to generation. Marlowe actually became the centre, the political and uh, spiritual hub of the community. People started to respect because if you break the law, then the, the penalty will simply be death. <laughs> Sorry about that. You gotta go. Malo Tagmoki Moki. Malo keeps his hands to himself. 
He does not touch what is not his. Teter mauki mauki. He does not permit his feet to carry him towards another's property. No matter how the world changed around them, the people still held on to Marlowe's law. When Koiki is a teenager, he is caught drinking and with a girl. The islanders have incorporated strict Christianity into their world and Koiki is to be punished. The white manager, Paddy Kaloran, offers Koiki a choice. Exile or a year of hard labour with no wages. When I got caught, I was sentenced to keep away from Murray for 12 months. I had an argument with Paddy Kaloran and his policies are what I call shithouse. He threatened to put me on his green truck and work for no wages at all. I refused. Quickie Mabo. Koiki opts for exile and begins working on the luggers. Torres Strait Islanders, because of their limited formal education, couldn't expect really to get jobs that were more than labouring. Labouring as cane cutters, labouring on the railway lines, doing other jobs that were manual labour. That's the only work they can do. You reckon a black person, you are, you got no brains. It's only the work you do is railway and cut canes. It is on the luggers that Koiki begins to question the inequalities he finds. White workers are paid higher wages than those given to black workers. Frustrated, he jumps ship in cans and makes his way to the cane fields of far north Queensland. It is here that he meets the love of his life, Benita. She was 16, I was about 20, and we sat at the same table. I was dying to meet her. She was very attractive. She carried herself pretty well. Yes, with dignity. Kuiki Mabo. Within 1957, when he came to my cousin's wedding. That afternoon I was putting decorations up, now this guy was standing at the door. And he, he was, and you know how you feel, oh, somebody's watching you? And when I looked to the door now, he was standing up there. Well, I was ashamed and I got down off the chair and I wouldn't do it. That was it. I was about 22, I think. She was 17. Then we got married. Quickie Mabo. With their hard-earned savings, Koiki and Benita move to Townsville and Koiki begins work on the wharves. If I went to the local shop and there were white people in the shop, it was automatically assumed that I would have to stand at the back of the shop and wait till all the white people were served and then I could go forward and it didn't matter how many white people came in, I could wait there all day, but I couldn't go forward until white people had been served first. Sometimes it used to make me that wild. We used to sort of go away and think, well, I wish I wasn't black. Yeah? Even when I went to school, I, I was told that Aboriginal people were very bad people. On the wharves, union men urge Koiki to agitate for change. But in these times, anyone who stirs up change is easily labelled a communist. Those of us who were asking for equal rights were cast as 
anti-Christian, anti-civilization. Our words were the works of the devil. And so there was a, a right-wing hysteria about us, you see. And then there were accusations that we were trying to create a separate state and we were black nationalists. You know, half a dozen of us were going to create a separate black state. There was people there who, whilst they might have agreed to what we were doing, but they would never come out and march with us or march behind the plane, so to speak. The first thing they thought of, that they would be jailed. Oh, yeah, you had to be gutsy, and he was gutsy. Um, he, he sort of wasn't, wasn't scared of anybody. He'd stand up and, and say his piece, you know. The Advancement League was regarded as a communist organisation. Everybody would look at me as a red commo. But it, that sort of didn't worry Eddie at all. He, um, he just said, no, I want to do something for my, my people, and, and they're the one that's listening to us, so we'll just go with them. And then they, they sacked him from the harbour ward and said that he was a communist. Koiki eventually gets a job as a gardener at the ironically named James Cook University. Although he is happy here, he has been in exile from his island for over 10 years. Well, with that, his memories of Murray Island came out through his artwork. He'd always draw Murray Island. I remember when I was growing up looking at him and him drawing it all the time, that Murray Island became easy to draw. All of us could draw morale. We've never been there, but we could draw it. It's a longing for you to be there because that's where you originate from. That's where you come from. That's where your mother and your father is, where your ancestors are buried. The longing is still there because uh, it's your home calling and your spirit calling you back to where you originally came from. When he was a gardener at the university and I would wander over to the library, you know, it, uh, quite regularly I would see uh, Koiki, a black labourer, sitting at uh, one of the uh, desks with these reports on the Torres Strait Islanders going through these and, uh, you know, I would stop and uh, say hello to him as what, what he was looking at this time and it was I can still remember his pointing out to me that some of these anthropologists and uh, linguists, etc., had got things wrong. Noel Luz invites Koiki to share his knowledge with his history students. Koiki tells them about the land he owns on the island of Mare. I thought, gee, uh, I'd better point out to him that he doesn't own that land, it's Crown land. And he was totally shocked uh, at that and uh, said, you know, I'd like to see anyone take my land off me, you know, that sort of thing. He couldn't understand why they were questioning him about this, about him owning land. He just knew that he did, you know, because his father gave it to him, and therefore, you know, then he'll hand it on to his children. But, you know, for them to question, it was like someone slapped him in the face. My father told me, son, this land will belong to you when I die. Koikimabo. In the Northern Territory, another group, the Yolongu, have also been told that their land is not theirs. The company is threatening to build the biggest mine in Australia on their doorstep. They paint a petition asking for the mine not to be built. The Yulnu people said, look, we told you this place is inhabited by our ancestral spirits and there are certain sacred sites here which you have to respect, but you haven't done that. You're going to bulldoze it.
And so when it dawned on them that they in fact had no rights to their land, they obtained the services of a legal team. The Yulnu people said, look, we're going to take this to court. And it's about ownership. They argued that it was their land since time immemorial, that they'd inherited it, that they had laws, and they gave substantial evidence, which the judge Blackburn could not deny was persuasive. And Blackburn overruled their demand for native title on a technical legal issue. That is, that Australia could not recognise their laws because of the acquisition of British sovereignty. In other words, the Terra Nullius Doctrine. Terra Nullius is a land without people. The British had wrongly settled this country. The assumptions underlying the British and their history was something that Aborigines disagreed with, but we've never given the opportunity to disagree with it. Koiki Marbo was searching for an answer to the question, how could it be argued rationally that the British come along and say, this is ours, when it clearly isn't, and that that for all time is taken as unchangeable law? <laughs> In response to Blackburn's court decision, a tent embassy is erected in protest on the lawns of Parliament House. Well, if you're Aboriginal and you're used to living in fringe camps, you put up a tent. You know, the fringe people, the dispossessed people, it becomes highly symbolic that the Aboriginal embassy should be in a tent. The embassy was an affront to that whole structure, saying, look, if you're going to disrespect our views and twist them around and give us one thing when we ask for something else, then we're going to disrespect your laws and we're going to camp until you give us land and give us an understanding that you understand what we mean when we say land rights. After six months, the police dismantled the tent embassy. Back in Townsville, with no government support, Koiki begins the first phase of his vision. He starts a black community school. The black community school that Koiki Mabo set up was, when I was young, famous in the Aboriginal movement because he was the first person to do something about the proposition that we should not lose our culture. For him, that was the defining element, if you like, of being an Indigenous person. Without your culture, you are nothing. You are a shadow. He's empowered us with that cultural sense. He's empowered us with this, the sense of knowing who we are. And um, he's empowered us with the thing of, when you go forward, you go forward as, you know, a Torres Strait Islander, and you'd be proud of, proud of that. Oh, he had a strong belief that he, he can do, he can help change, you know, make it better for, for, or especially for the, you know, his children. He wanted everything to be better than what he had. She supported me all the way. She was there all the time. I was able to discuss things with her, talk with her. She doesn't get carried away the way I do. Kwikimabo. Yeah. 
Koiki establishes services for black Queenslanders who have endured poor housing, substandard health and no legal representation to protect their rights. The Queensland government has done everything that it possibly can to promote the welfare of the people of Palm Island and the Aboriginals generally. Uh, the talk about poor conditions and the way the people are treated, of course, is simple and absolute nonsense. Bielke Peterson and his government, over many, many years, believed and persuaded people to believe that Queensland was a state for the white man. So it was a, an absolutely controlling regime. There was fear, there was persecution, there was extreme violence. And there was an extraordinary apparatus to keep a, a regime of fear. So that Aboriginal, the Aboriginal population, a very large population, was controlled. He was getting death threats. You know, people ring up and go, we know where you live. We know how many children you have. Do you know where your children are? He came home from work one day and uh, he said to us, you know, uh, not to go outside and stay inside because he, he was frightened that somebody might, uh, might come along with the gun and sh try and shoot him. So he had the lights off and, uh, yeah, no TV, nothing. We couldn't do anything, we just, you know, sat in the dark. He resorted to him and Mum sleeping in the lounge with a shotgun. I'll put a mattress out in the lounge room and he'll sleep out in the lounge and I'll sit on the chair just to... I'd sort of one goes, you know, go to sleep. So you just keep a ear or anything. In the midst of Koiki's political activity, he hears that his father is dying. Under the law of Queensland, Anyone entering the islands must first get written permission to visit. They weren't going to allow him to land on Murray to spread his own belief there. But he wasn't going to spread his belief at all. He was, just wanted to go back to see his father, who was sick at the time. I think um, with the permission being denied, they were trying to break his spirit. But it... it didn't it, if anything, it made him stronger and more determined to do what he needed to do. Koiki's father dies without seeing his son again. Uh, that's a si sad part of that of the story there. Uh, the life in the life of uh, Irimapo. And uh, that was one of the main things that actually triggered him to fight for his rights. That is to make sure that uh, he'd be able to fight against, you know, against the Queensland government, against anything that was standing in his way. Uh, so when the opportunity presents itself, he took it with both hands. Back in Townsville, Koiki and others organise a land rights conference. Koiki addresses the delegates. In the Torres Strait, land ownership is the same throughout. The system has existed as long as we could remember. The land was inherited always by the male descendants. During his lifetime, he would make sure that his family and friends knew which one of his sons would be heir to his land. None of the land will be ever sold for cash. We came up. The initiating factor in the Mabo case was a conference held in Townsville in September 1981, which was on land rights and racial discrimination in Queensland. And from that conference, instructions were given by Eddie Mabo to start a case. I first met Eddie in 1982, and he spoke to me about his planned case. He said first, well, you know, Blackburn said that uh, Aborigines don't have rights to land because they have communal rights or interests. He said, well, we Torres Strait Islanders, we're completely different. We have vegetable gardens. We have our own houses on these small islands. So he's wrong on that one. 
it, the land was owned by individuals, passed down from individual to individual, and the European mind could understand that. And I realised he'd read it, he'd analysed it, he'd seen what arguments could be put up, and he'd said mine is the ideal test case to, to run it. But in my own mind, I thought, they'll never win this. It's just too big. You can't overturn the whole uh, legal situation on which Australia was settled. Most of the community didn't really believe that you could upset the government, upset the country, uh, even upset Terran alias. On the 20th of May 1982, a statement of claim over Murray Island and its surrounding waters is lodged by five Torres Strait Islander people, Selyu Asali, Sam and Dave Passy, James Rice and Eddie Koiki Mabo. With assistance from legal aid, they assemble their legal team. I suddenly realised that uh, the Queensland government, for instance, the Australian government, were claiming our land and I was saying that's not your land. You came from England, not from here. So that was the reason we took the government. And government is big, it is big. But uh, we were not aware how small we are. We only knew who we were. Koiki and his co-claimants, with no available funds, seek support from legal aid. To the best of my understanding, judged by statements in the Queensland Parliament, they thought we were a bunch of southern communist do-goody, do-gooder lawyers who should be, uh, who should not be granted a visa to enter Queensland. The Commonwealth Games are to be staged in Brisbane and black leadership seizes the opportunity to organise a mass land rights demonstration to shame Joe at his proudest moment. What was at stake for Australia in the lead up to the Commonwealth Games was a showpiece to the international community that here is a state in the Commonwealth of Australia that has no land rights legislation at all and a denial of Aboriginal self-determination such that people still live on reserve communities which are governed by white public servants. If the athletes were centre stage, so were Australia's Aborigines. They took their battle for land rights to the streets and for the first time were seen on the front pages and the television screens of the world as the foreign media poured into Queensland. What do we want? Land rights! When do we want it? Now! What do we want? Land rights! Violent clashes erupt as police, under Bielke Peterson's directive, clamp down on protesters. The Minister for Aboriginal Affairs at that time was interviewed and he said, oh, our Aborigines eat goannas and they don't wear clothes, so, you know, they don't need money. And he said that to the international media. You know, the people on the reserves up there, if you want to use the argument, I mean, they think our department's very good. You know, we supply all sorts of uh, food stuff to them and that sort of thing. I don't think that uh, they're really uh, advanced to a stage when you could give them free whole land and this sort of thing because they wouldn't know what it was. You see, uh, you, uh, the, these people basically have never been used to having money much. You know, they, they normally uh, live out in, um, in areas where they don't use much and they sort of uh, catch birds and goannas and all this sort of thing. To the surprise of the Queensland government, the Islanders' case begins hearings in 1986. The case is called Mabo versus Queensland, and Koiki is the first witness. He endures cross-examination by Joe's lawyers. He was subject to a very lengthy and, and a determined attack in cross-examination by Queensland. And he kept saying, my girl, they're trying to um, discredit me. And I said, what does that mean, Dad? Can you explain that a little bit more for me? He goes, well, they're trying to dig up all the dirt they can on me. And I said, why, well, you don't have any dirt, do you? And he goes, no, I might have a parking fire. 
but quickly was ready. You know, that's why he said that uh, my strength comes from the domain that I belong to. You see, that's, that's where I get my strength from, being a Marian. I'm standing in my domain. These people, are, they, come, they come from, they are outsiders. They come to fight me about something that is mine. I want to tell you what I know about my people and culture did not come from books written by academics. My textbooks were my parents and all my people of the Eastern Torres Straits who contributed to the knowledge I now have. Kwikimam. Koiki's evidence is interrupted by a bombshell thrown by the Queensland government that threatens to destroy the case. Now, as far as we know, what happened there was Queensland's lawyers looked at Eddie's statement of claim and said, well, he may have a chance. And Joe, in his no-nonsense manner, said, well, even if he's got a chance, we've got to do something about it. Let's just legislate his claim out of existence. And it basically said, look, the Torres Strait Islands became part of the colony of Queensland in 1879, that any property rights that the islanders had are hereby extinguished as of 1879 with no compensation payable. The law was enacted. That left us in a, in a very difficult position. If that was a good law, that was the end of the case, full stop. No, no, no case. So Koiki Mabo's legal team took that statute to the High Court as an act of racial discrimination and the High Court ruled that it was racial discrimination and uh, ruled it invalid. Outside the courts, Australia prepares to celebrate the bicentenary, marking 200 years of European occupation. About 200 Brisbane Aborigines gathered at their traditional meeting ground at Musgrave Park to prepare for the 2,000 kilometre bus trip to Sydney. Five days before Australia Day celebrations and protest is already evident. At the same time, hundreds from the Northern Territory and Western Australia have already travelled thousands of kilometres through much of South Australia and Victoria. Before they go on to Sydney, they'll meet busloads of people from Tasmania and Melbourne. All up, nearly 10,000 protesters from... The first Australians descend en masse to Sydney, expecting the Prime Minister to fulfil his bicentennial promise of a treaty, a hope of resolving the unfinished business the nation has with the first Australians. Prime Minister is under pressure from big business interests as the people wait for him to make good on his promise. But it meant nothing and there was no commitment and uh, nothing happened. And then he cried publicly on television that he hadn't done enough and uh, we can only agree with him. All hope for any recognition for the first Australians now rests on the outcome of Koiki's case. He returns to the island of Mare with his lawyers and the entire Supreme Court. Silence, all stand, please. It's perhaps opposite that I remark that this is an historic occasion. It is the first sittings of the Supreme Court of Queensland on Murray Island. The case is an, is an important Again and again, the islanders explain the significance of Marlowe's law. Fantastic. Murray Islands have an historical tribal law called Marlowe's Fantastic. Law, named after the god Marlowe, who lived among the Murray Islanders many years ago. One villager, Sam Passy, has told the sittings here that the only real Murray Islander is one who follows Marlowe's law. The laws that was established created the structure of that civilization. The more common one that people, you know, talk about, the tag mauki mauki, tetel mauki mauki. Tag mauki mauki, you keep your hands to yourself. Don't touch what is other people's. Tetel Moki, your legs must not take you to 
into other people's property. Koiki shows the judge the boundaries that mark his land. This is the one here. And from here, it goes straight into the bush about 100 yards. And this is the, the boundary line here. These sort of things that can be seen all over this island. Other families have constructed these things, not just lately, but over many years. In 1990, Moynihan announces his recommendations to the High Court. Whilst he acknowledges that a form of land ownership does exist, his findings are a crushing blow to Koiki. At the core of Moynihan's decision was that he did not believe Koiki's adoption was lawful and therefore was not the heir to his father's land. Remember that the core of the attack by Queensland was that Eddie Mabo was not the person he said he was. The core of the attack was that Eddie Mabo was not adopted from his natural parents to relations of his on Murray Islands, Benny and Maiga Mabo. His natural father was a person called Sambo. His mother died within weeks of his birth, so that uh, in 1936, he was adopted island way under customary adoption. The child was given to a family who could not have children of their own. B in dad's case, having a single father trying to raise a small child and going, I can't do this. I'll hand you back to your mother's brother. So now uh, he's taken on the Mabo family name. And that becomes real. Sometimes it's, it's not even um, recorded down in the white man's law that uh, such a child has been adopted. You know, but they recognize this uh, through the, their own traditional way of adoption. If it's put to you, you are not really uh, Eddie Mabo at all. You're somebody else. You're going to resent that. And he did. And I think rightfully so. Despite his bitter rejection of the judge's finding, Koiki agrees not to appeal the judge's ruling on his adoption as it will distract from and delay the key decision on land ownership. He also makes another strategic decision to take separate legal representation from the other claimants so as not to jeopardise their legal arguments before the High Court. Of course he was disappointed. But then Koiki knew that James Rice and I and others were, were for the case. We st stood firm on it, and so that helped. I think it helped him. He had, however, the comfort of knowing that a, a, a case which bore his name and which he had, was primarily responsible for and was primarily driving was proceeding on track into the, into the High Court of Australia. Prior to the case being heard in the High Court, two of the other claimants had died. The case now moves forward, primarily focused on the evidence of two claimants, James Rice and Dave Passy. After 10 long years, the High Court judges adjourn to consider the evidence. Indigenous people wait anxiously for the outcome, as does Koiki back in Townsville. I knew he was getting sick because he'd, he'd constantly walk around the yard and he'd be hitting at his hip, he'd just be banging on his hips and he'd say, my hip's really, really sore. What's wrong with him? Tell me what's wrong with him. And the doctor looked at his book and he shook his head. He said, I don't know what's wrong with him. He had cancer and this cancer spread right through his body. And by that time, it's about his lungs in it couldn't talk properly. And even through his illness, he was just, you know, making sure everybody was there. Go to that court case, go sit in for me. You know, I can't be there, so you, I need you there to go and listen for me. Late at night, from Koiki's hospital bed, he writes. I lay in bed thinking about the future and how I would like it to be. Even if I am not here, 
I thought about the struggles I had been through over the past years, while the rest of Black Australia awaits with me for the High Court decision to be brought down at any time. Or would it be in time? I also thought about my wife, the most important person in my life, the most adorable person, a friend closest in my life, a most wonderful lover, and we loved every minute of our lives together. Eddie Koikimabo dies in Benita's arms on the 21st of January, 1992. Five months later, the High Court advises they will deliver their verdict. I then rang Murray Island. I spoke to a lady at the phone box at the council chambers. And I said, do you remember Eddie Mabo's case? And she said, yes. Well, I'm ringing you from the High Court building in Canberra, and the judges have just handed down the decision, and Eddie Mabo's won his case. And she went, oh, screams and yells, and phone fell down, there was great clattering noise, and she seemed to rush out of the phone booth, and I heard this strange noise proceeding in the, in the distance as she announced the news to people on the island. And uh, that was a special moment. I just walked down just towards the church with my hands up. We've won, we've won, we've won. And I do that when I... <laughs> Malo's hand. Sorry, this is true. David Passy explained what the Marbo case was about. He held up his two arms like this, and he said, we have Marlowe's law, and then there is the white man's law. So what we've done with this Marbo decision is we've brought Marlowe's law and the white man's law together so we can have a law which is right and strong. You know, at the, at the end, you can see that everything Ed done was for everybody. It wasn't just for him. It came out all right in the end, but then um, he wasn't here to, to, to receive all the accolade that he, uh, he would have received here, but still. His name is up and lights and it's in history. And uh, it will go on. Eddie Mabo, he shine. For the first time, Australia has recognized that the first Australians were indeed the owners of the country prior to European occupation. Next up, Aboriginal land claims. How safe is your home? The state governments, the pastoral industry, the graziers, and the mining industry formed an unholy alliance and gathered in Canberra and they ran a multi-million dollar campaign to depict the Marbo findings of the High Court as utter evil, as the end of Australia's land tenure system, would produce anarchy, would destroy our economy. They're being asked to pay taxes to fund people who are seeking title to land, productive land, to which they've made no contribution to its productivity. The Mabo ruling on Aboriginal land rights is set to cause uproar, with claims it could lead to a form of apartheid. It says if you bought a block of land after 1975, your backyard might not be your own. It was an outburst of vile race hate, and it was insane. Claims of premedicated genocide, systematic and widespread massacres now frequently cited by the guilt industry are total nonsense. The people 
had a terrible time, there's no doubt about that, because of the clash of cultures, two totally different cultures. But uh, to suggest there was some policy of annihilation, I'm, I'm sure, is wrong. And most of it was completely and absolutely wrong. <laughs> Koiki's people gather to honour him and celebrate his life with the islander tradition of a tombstone opening. This is time now where we rejoice that we know that his spirit is rest in peace, that his spirit is also still here with us though. But the celebrations are short-lived. Overnight, the tombstone is badly vandalised. The family make the decision to return Koiki to his island. At, uh, the last Chris Christmas we had with him, uh, he he drew a mud map of, of the area of our uh, last village where he wanted to be buried. So he's happy now where, you know, back home where his ancestors are buried there too, all the way up in, into the back of those hills there. It is that spiritual affiliation. You are not by yourself. You, you belong to that soil. From that soil you were created. And when you die, you should go back to the soil. And that tie, the bond is unbreakable. You to your land, to the, to the soil. For the first time in 40 years, the Malo dance is performed in Koiki's honor. believe that um, even though we don't really have support from from people out there that much but the freedom will come uh, for the island people not only the island people freedom will come for the Aboriginal people and also freedom will come for the white society as well and I said to him well I can understand you you know with if you fight against the terra nullius and you get rid of that uh, you can set the Ab Aboriginal people free, the Islander people free, but how, uh, what do you mean that you're going to set the, the white society free, the white people free? And he said, because the white society is living a lie. And I said, what do you mean? He said, they see us, but then they say we are not here. And that's because of Terra Nullius. So they've got a big chain around their neck, they've got a, a chain around their minds, so they are bound just as, just as much as we are. And he said, so uh, uh, we tear an alias out of the way. Uh, we are no longer just shadows anymore. If they want to talk to us about anything, they have to plant us as a person now. Before we were just shadows, we were non-entities. I said, but now, they will see us for what we really are, indigenous people of the land. Yeah. 
There's a pagan moon rising from the coral sea, red as the embers on his fire. The old man sits alone while the village people sleep. Dreams of his children are so dire. Yesterday is truly gone. Memories are history now, but it's told by his story songs, sung by his people from before his time. Oh, According to my tradition, those fish, the prawn, whatever is in that sea, belongs to me and my people.